and welcome to the second part of my Nile Arthotep build video. Now, a bit of a sunny day today, so perhaps not the best weather for a Nile Arthotep video. It should really be a bit dark and shadowy, uh, but at least you can see where I've got to. Now, obviously the last part of this video was a few months back, and it's fair to say I have struggled a little bit with this. I've spoken in recent videos about sort of motivation for long-scale projects and sort of maintaining your interest over a long period of time. And it's only sort of now that I'm sort of getting close to the idea that I, I had in my head when I originally started thinking about doing this. So it's been a bit of a struggle to get to this point and obviously I have got distracted by skulls and various other projects along the way. So there's been a bit of a break and a bit of a struggle to sort of get this one uh, closer to the finish line but there's been some progress so it's time for a part two. So in this video we're going to be looking at the progress so far on the sculpture. Obviously, as you can see, he's now moulded, so I'm going to be going through the moulding process. Uh, I've also put some armour together on him as well, uh, as you can see on the shoulder, and I'm going to be casting that up uh, in a future video, but at least we can see how that might look. Uh, obviously, he's got a bit of a cloak on as well, and that was sort of always an idea for the sculpture. That's just a, a bit of cloth at the minute. I'll be putting something to get a bit more purpose made uh, together for that. And also, he's got that massive writhing tentacles and a hand holding those as well. So, getting closer to the finish line, so let's get started. At the end of the last video we would got the tentacles of the lower body more or less in shape but at that point I hadn't gone through and detailed them and put some skin textures in. So that's the next order of business. For the tentacles I started cutting in some channels so the idea being that as the tentacle flexes it would cause the skin to flex and that can form sort of wrinkles in the texture of the skin. So I wanted to try and sort of replicate that in. I'd already sculpted some sort of basic muscle definition into the tentacle so it's got sort of a couple of uh, ridges running down the body of the tentacle but what I wanted to do was to actually vary the um, levels of the clay on the sculpture. Purely taking away clay like cutting channels in it can sometimes look a bit to sort of I don't know what the term is, negative I suppose, and that you've only ever removed material you've not added. And skin isn't like that, you know, um, you have ridges coming up and indents uh, that are lower. And so in order to sort of give a degree of variety, I'm just adding in some additional blobs of clay and sort of working those into the detail to try and give a slightly more natural variation to the look of the tentacle. Once I've got some basic shapes in place, I then come in with my loop tool, which is this loop of guitar string. And um, that's got a bit of a texture to it. And that acts like a rake, so I can then move the clay about and sort of smooth out those shapes and sort of uh, refine them a little bit further. I've increasingly taken to using brushes when working on monster clay. I find them a really nice way of sort of softening the detail that I've put in. Obviously the brush isn't very hard, so it's not going to destroy any of the detail that you've put in. But what it does have the effect of doing is sort of to soften the edges and sort of smooth out um, some of the shapes. So I've actually found that in certain circumstances you can actually brush the monster clay to a really smooth finish just with a brush. I'm not using any solvents or anything like that on, the, on this piece, I'm just brushing it with this uh, brush. And that has the effect of smoothing the clay out really really nicely. So it's a technique that I've found myself using increasingly when I've been putting texture into monster clay sculptures. And now as a final pass I'm pressing some crinkled tin foil into the monster clay as well and this just adds a sort of a random pattern of indentations. Um, you can't use it too much I find if you press in too much you get quite a uh, jagged sort of effect on the clay and that might be desirable in some circumstances but for this sort of organic um, tentacle I don't want anything too extreme but it does add a degree of randomness to the textures on there which is difficult to accomplish just with sculpting tools alone. I then continue to use the same technique on the other tentacles on the uh, piece. I tried to vary up things a little bit, so the larger tentacles had a slightly more jagged look to them, whereas the smaller tentacles had slightly more uh, gentle detail on them. Now obviously I always intended to put a cloak on the character, and so detailing the back perhaps is a little bit pointless. I'm putting some in though, just so that the back of the sculpture isn't completely blank. Now another item that I've always intended to have on this is some shoulder pads, some shoulder armour. So what I'm doing here is just building up a basic shape in cardboard and then covering that shape with foam. I've got an idea for quite a smooth flowing shape and it's the sort of thing I don't think I'd be able to sculpt so easily but you can get some nice shapes with foam pretty easily so I'm going to use this as a base. 
As you can see, I've got a cutout from one of my skulls here as well, and that's just a nice quick way to add some detail. I might need to relax on the use of skulls uh, in my sculptures uh, for future projects because they could end up looking quite samey, but uh, for this one at least it makes sense. Now in order to add a rigid surface to this, what I'm going to do is take some glass fibre here and just super glue this onto the foam. Now if I cover this in super glue, that will sort of act the same as resin really and allow me to very quickly build up a hard surface on the foam. Okay, not looking too bad now it's very rough uh, but what i can do is come in with some car body filler otherwise known as bondo and give it a layer of bondo over the super glue and glass fiber mesh and that will then allow me to sand that down to a smooth finish Now this sort of thing it can take a few passes just to get all the details filled in um, so it's just a question of um, adding bondo sanding down re-adding where you need it just so you can get that nice smooth finish and bondo can be sanded really really smooth with finer grades of sandpaper so it's really useful for getting a very nice smooth finish Okay, so just a quick test fitting halfway through and that's looking pretty good I think. Uh, what it needs though is an edging strip. So what I'm going to do is use this which is a bicycle brake cable. It's got a nice smooth finish and it's easily bendable. So what I'm going to do is super glue this onto the edge of the piece that I've already created. Okay, not looking too bad. Now obviously I need a little bit more refinement on this, but it's a good first start, I think. I mentioned in the previous video that I wasn't too happy with the texture on the chest, so I'm just taking the opportunity now to redo all of that to give it a bit more of a consistent look. Getting to the point now where I can actually start thinking about moulding the piece. So what I'm going to do is pull off the crown and get the sculpture ready for moulding. Now I had thought about casting the crown up, but to be honest with you, I think it's just going to be a bit of a waste of time. So I'm actually just going to scratch build that and use the um, crown elements I already have to make a uh, one-off piece that can fit onto the sculpture. So I'm just removing all of those elements I had stuck into the sculpture and redoing all the skin texture so it's ready for moulding. Right, so here's a quick test fitting of the sculpture. I plan to actually sew up a proper cloak for this or some sort of costume piece, but this is just to get an idea of how the final piece will look. I was worrying that the shoulder pad might have been a little bit too big for the sculpture, but actually with the cloak in place it actually looks pretty good, so I'm quite happy with that. Okay, we're now ready for moulding, and I've got the um, sculpture sitting on the workbench with some plastic down so I can capture all of the silicon that's going to flow off the sculpture. And what I've done is to create this little socket in the rib cage, and the reason for that is because I want to attach some tentacles and an arm holding the tentacles um, to the final piece. So what, that's going to be done as a separate item. So what I need is a connection in place so that I can attach the two pieces together when they're finished. Now the moulding process for this is exactly the same as uh, the moulding process for my zombie sculpture or my orc or many of the other larger scale sculptures you've seen me do. The only difference here really is that this sculpture is much larger than anything I've done before. So that's going to mean I'm going to have to think quite carefully about uh, the sort of structural elements of this, like how is the mould going to hold itself together once I remove the sculpture from it. So I'll come to that in a little bit, but for the time being the um, initial stages of the moulding process are precisely the same. I'm covering the sculpture in a detail layer, and that's just to pick up all the details of the uh, sculpture that I've, I've put in. And I'm using an airbrush to blow the silicon into the details of the sculpture. You can run the risk of the silicon flowing over the sculpture when you dump it on like this, but some 
sometimes air bubbles can form or it won't quite get into the details that you've put in. So in order to make sure you get everything, you need to be quite painstaking in getting the silicon into all of those little details. And a good way of doing that without accidentally stabbing the sculpture with a spatula is to use an airbrush to blow the silicon into those details. Once I've got that initial detail layer on, I can then come in with a thickened uh, batch of silicon. And that's just done by adding a fixotropic agent to the silicon, which thickens it up and makes it like a paste. So the process from now on is to build up the layer of thickness of the silicon into something that can hold itself together basically when you come to pour your resin in. Now it looks a bit of a mess at the minute, but it's just a painstaking slow process of thickening up that layer until it's in a good place. Okay, that took a while, but as you can see, we've now got a fairly decent layer of thickness all over the sculpture. Now, once again, I'm going to use these trays that I've created to make some bars of silicon. And what I'm going to be doing is attaching these to the back of the mold, and they're going to allow me to have some registration points and a thick layer of silicon where I'm going to cut the mold in order to free the sculpture. With this sort of thing, you run the risk of these uh, pieces just sliding off the sculpture. I'm effectively gluing them on with more silicon. Um, so in order to stop that happening, what I'm actually using is sewing uh, pins, and I'm just pushing those through the silicon into the sculpture itself. Because the detail layer of silicon has already dried on the sculpture, I don't think I'm going to run the risk of having any damage to the mould by doing this. The pins are very, very thin, so I don't think they'll, um, they'll be anything visible. So um, that's the method I'm using, and I'm just pushing those in to hold this in place while the silicon that I've added dries. What I'm also doing is putting some registration points on the front of the uh, silicon as well. There's going to be a layer of fiberglass over the whole thing to hold everything in place. And so these will just allow the silicon to line up with the fiberglass jacket. Now I need a way of separating the two halves of the fiberglass jacket, so what I'm doing is using this cardboard. Um, I've saved this just from a chair that we um, had delivered over Christmas, and I'm going to create a surround around the sculpture by drawing around it and then cutting the shape out. So what I'm going to do is just build up a surround around the sculpture, and I'm going to add some bits of cardboard on here just to give it some structural strength. Okay, we've got quite a rigid frame now holding that in place. Um, this might seem a little bit too much, but with this sort of thing, you don't want it to move while you're making your jacket. So just make it as strong as you possibly can. If it seems too much, that's good because it's going to save you some potential difficulties down the line. So what I'm now doing is covering the whole thing in a layer of aluminium tape. And that's going to give me a nice smooth finish that the fiberglass won't stick to. So I can now proceed to cover the entire thing in a layer of fiberglass. And as you can see, I've added some keys on the sides as well. So that's just so the two halves of the fiberglass mold can line up again. Well, that's now dry. So what I can now do is flip it around, pull the cardboard divider off and add fiberglass to the other side. Just giving the edges a quick clean up. And once again, I'm giving it a layer of aluminium tape and that's just so the two halves of the fiberglass don't stick together process is now exactly the same again, just add a layer of fiberglass over the whole thing. Okay, this is now dry, so I'm just drilling some holes so I can put some bolts through the whole thing. And I can then use a chisel to start working this free. Well, there we go, so it's come away uh, pretty easily. So what I now need to do is think about how the two halves of the mold are going to align once I get my sculpture out of this. This is quite a large item, and so the potential for the mold misaligning is quite high. So what I'm doing is something that I did for a recent skull mold that I made, and I'm pushing some holes through the silicon here. What I'm gonna do is push some aluminium uh, bar through these holes once I've actually got the sculpture out of the mold. And that's gonna allow me to realign the two halves of the mold as closely as I can. Yeah. 
I was thinking I might actually have to cut the uh, lines going to the shoulders as well, but it actually looks like I'm going to be able to free this without doing that, so that's pretty good. So that's come out pretty well, I think. Um, and there's my sculpture. So it's now time to get the silicon back into the fiberglass mold jacket. And as I mentioned, what I'm doing is using some short pieces of aluminium wire to push into the holes that I created in the silicon. And that's going to allow me to realign the two halves of the mold as closely as I can. I was worrying slightly that I wouldn't be able to get this back into the fiberglass jacket very easily but actually it looks like it's gone in really really well so that's really useful and I can now put some bolts into the mold to secure it all together so that's now ready for molding now I'm going to be rotocasting this obviously if I was to pour this in as a solid item that would be like liters and liters of resin so um, and obviously quite expensive so I'm not gonna be doing that I'm going to be rotocasting it to create a hollow cast now Previously I've done this by hand, but some of you will have seen in videos on Instagram and YouTube that I've been building a rotocaster. And this is just a device that allows you to rotate a mould in several different planes rather than doing it by hand. So it's a bit of a labour saving device really, um, and saves you sort of standing there for ages, slowly rotating the mould and sloshing the resin around on the inside of the mould. So what I'm going to do is tie my mould to the rotocaster and use that to rotate the piece. It looks like I didn't quite catch it on video, but what I'm doing is using a funnel here to pour some resin into the mould. Now, the difficulty with this is I didn't really know how much resin to pour in, so I decided to do it in several batches. Um, the larger skulls that I've been making use about 350 grams of resin. Uh, this is larger than those, so I was sort of thinking maybe about a kilo would be about right. So that's what I'm going to go for, and I'm going to do it in several batches. So I've poured that in and I've put a bit of tape over the inlet just so the resin doesn't escape. Now I was sort of expecting to have to uh, push this quite a lot, so I haven't finished any of the mechanisms on the rotocaster yet, so there's nothing to actually make it drive itself, it's all hand operated for the time being. What I actually found was that this was a little bit unbalanced, so um, that did make it swing on its own, but kind of not in a uniform way. Nevertheless, it seemed to carry on on its own quite well, so that was quite good. Uh, but because it wasn't such a uniform uh, motion, I think what I found is that the resulting cast is thicker in certain areas than others. So um, we'll see when I take this out that some areas are a little bit thinner and some areas are very, very thick. It's a bit of a learning curve for this thing, I suppose. You know, maybe it's better to hand cast sometimes and not others, I don't know. Or maybe it's simply a matter of balancing the mold in the rotocaster correctly. This is the largest mold that the rotocaster will actually take, and I sort of deliberately made it this way. Um, obviously, I don't have the biggest of workshops, so I needed to make something that would fit um, quite easily into my workshop, but at the same time would accommodate all of the things I wanted to make. So, generally speaking, I'm going to be doing skulls, maybe some helmets and masks so as long as I could sort of basically fit a head in there I figured that was okay. The Nile Earth tip sculpture is actually a bit larger than that so as you can see I've got it on a diagonal here but um, I deliberately made it so that that would fit so um, this isn't going to be used for this sort of thing very often um, nevertheless it's uh, worth worth noting that if you're ever going to try and it's certainly something I'll obviously bear in mind when I come to do some more rotocasting with this in the future. Okay, so now the moment of truth. Now this did actually go a little bit wrong, unfortunately. The resin has a cure time of about two hours and I left this for about three, I think. But when I started taking it out of the mold, I noticed that it had started deforming a little bit and clearly wasn't quite set. It wasn't hard enough. I should have really left this overnight. But the problem was once I'd already taken it out of the mold and it had sort of deformed a bit, I didn't want to put it back in the mold, have it completely dry and then find that there were deformities in it. So once I had sort of started taking it out of the mold I figured I should probably continue but that meant that the cast was sort of deforming all over the place so initially it was looking like a bit of a disaster. But what I realised was that I could blow into the inlet where I poured the resin. I just sort of drilled it out again so there was a channel. And that was enough to actually reflate the sculpture, as it were. So um, that was a bit weird and kind of uh, unexpected, but it actually did the trick. So what I did was to blow into the sculpture. You can sort of see a little bit of that on the video. Uh, but 
obviously I couldn't just leave this on the workbench because it would deform again. So what I decided to do was actually hang it from the workshop ceiling. That way the main bit of force would be on the tail of the sculpture. It was sort of the best I could come up with really, but it worked well enough. So yeah, as I mentioned, the, the thickness of the sculpture was a little bit um, uneven. So in some places you can see that this is a little bit thin. And certainly down by the tail, that's just one big block of resin. So in a sense that's kind of cool because I've got a solid foundation for the thing to stand on. But it is a little bit too thin in certain places and there are some gaps. So I'm in two minds about whether I'm going to use this cast as the final piece or whether I'll cast myself up another one. Um, there's quite a lot of resin in this. so. I'm loath to sort of um, destroy it and waste it but at the same time maybe I should I'll, I'll decide later but for the time being this is good enough for me to use to continue working on the piece so I've got this plug that I made early on what I need to do is attach some wires to this and then start building up the monster clay to create the tentacles and the hand that's holding them now in order to secure that in place, what I've decided to do is actually cut a hole in the back of the sculpture. That way I can put a screw through from the back to hold it in place. This also has the added bonus of me being able to get in there and actually fixing some of the holes and things in the sculpture as well. So it's sort of um, a bit of a necessary evil unfortunately. As you know it will be wearing a cloak so this won't be viewable and I could glue the piece back in place if I wanted to. So uh, this seemed like a good compromise to actually get the piece finished. While I was at it, I also took the opportunity to clean up for the sculpture as well. Although I took steps to make sure the mould wasn't too misaligned, there are still some mould lines in the back, so I'm going to have to grind these down and refill where, where needed. Obviously it will be wearing the cloak, so it's maybe less of an issue than it otherwise would be, but um, nevertheless worth noting that that's still an issue, even though I took some steps to try and avoid it. Okay, so now I've got my wire in place, I can now start building up the monster clay around it. I'm just using the rough forms that I made previously and trying to attach those in place. Now because the Nihilothotep sculpture was really, really big, it actually used loads and loads of monster clay. I think there's like three tubs in this thing, so I need to reuse it. It's quite interesting though, when you mould monster clay, I think the silicon sort of leaches something out of the clay because it feels really, really dry and hard when it comes out of the mould, as opposed to the sort of waxy feel that it normally has. Now I found that that isn't really a problem once you sort of heat it up, and um, that seems to sort of revive it and reconstitute it, so it's not too much of a problem. But it does make it quite difficult to actually break the sculpture back down again. I don't think this was helped by the temperature in the workshop either, it's quite cold in the UK at the moment. So I've actually resorted to using a chisel and a hammer here to actually break it apart, it's that tough. So that was a bit of an ordeal but I managed to chip off enough that I could uh, put it in the microwave and reheat it uh, to continue working on the sculpture. Right, so this is where we've got to so far. Now obviously there's still a fair amount to do with this. I've still got to refine all of this sort of hand and tentacle setup. Doesn't quite look right so far. I've also got to cast up all of the, ar the shoulder armor here and uh, do a second set for the other shoulder. I also need to scratch build the crown and obviously also paint it and just get it looking cool. So still a fair bit to do, but I'm determined to finish it. So we're gonna get there in the end. So if you've made it this far, thanks very much for watching and I shall see you in the next video. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to support the channel, then please do give us a like and subscribe and all the usual YouTube stuff. The more concrete way of supporting the channel is heading over to my Etsy store, which is the Sculpture Studio, where I have a variety of skull-based sculptures for those who are interested in such things. If you'd like to follow what I do, I'm also on Instagram and Facebook. Just search for The Dark Power.